Hello and welcome to the Reconstructing Children's Rights Institute's conversation confronting colonialism, racism, patriarchy in the children and youth rights funding ecosystem. This is the third conversation in our multi-part discussion series on racism and power as they affect children, young people and families in settings around the world. I'm Gazelle Keshavazian and I'll be facilitating the conversation on behalf of the CPC Learning Network. One of the ways that systematic racism, power imbalances, and patriarchy underpins the international development and humanitarian aid architecture is its funding policies, decision-making mechanisms, and structures. And then the children and youth rights and protection funding ecosystem is no different. In general, within the children's funding ecosystem, the power and resources are consolidated within the bilateral, multilateral donors and foundations residing in high-income countries, the resources flow from them down to the UN agencies and international NGOs who manage and have access to resources and hold the levels of power. And very little goes down to the local organizations or communities. We are starting to see some interesting examples of innovative funding mechanisms, which are reinventing donor giving by shifting resources and power closer to the children and young people and families. We are honored to have three experts today to help us unpack all of this and share their experiences of launching new innovative funds. Dr. Rama Tubangura, Saji Prelis, and Fasil Miriam. They will look back at what has gone wrong, but more importantly, will look forward by giving us some solutions. Before I introduce the speakers and launch the conversation, I do want to note that the views expressed today will be personal and not representative of their organizations. Dr. Ramatu Bangura is leading the design and inception of the Child Rights Innovation Fund, or CRIF. Prior to CRIF, Ramatu previously served as program officer for the Novo Foundation's Advancing Adolescent Girls' Rights Initiative, which she co-led strategy development and grant making to advance philanthropy's largest portfolio working to advance the rights and leadership and well-being of adolescent girls worldwide. Ramatu has spent over 25 years working on behalf of young girls in New York City, Washington, D.C., and as a Peace Corps volunteer in Costa Rica. She has earned her master's education and doctorate of education in international and transcultural studies at Teachers College, Columbia University. Fasal Miriam has more than 20 years of experience working with disadvantaged children, youth, and families in communities. He's a founder and executive director of the Child Rights and Violence Prevention Fund a newly established organization based in Kampala, Uganda, provides grants and technical support to community organizations and local NGOs to prevent violence and build adolescence girls' power in Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, and Ethiopia. Before joining the fund, Faso initiated Oak Foundation's East Africa grant-making portfolio. He's co-founded organizations in Ethiopia and has had a wealth of experience working with various international organizations. Finally, Saji Prelis is a co-chair and global coalition on youth peace and security and the director of the Children Youth Program's Search for Common Ground. Saji has over 20 years of experience working with youth movements and youth-focused organizations in conflict and transition environments in over 35 countries. In 2010, he co-founded and was co-chairing the first UN CSO donor working group that helped advocate for the historic UN Security Council, Resolution 2250, 2419, and 2534. He's a distinguished Luxembourg Peace Prize for his outstanding achievements in peace support. He's obtained his master's degrees in international peace and conflict resolution in a concentration in international law from American University. Thank you, Ramatu Saji Fasil, for joining us today. To start the conversation, in your view, what does the current children and youth rights funding ecosystem look like? And how does it further perpetuate colonial, patriarchal, racist framings and overarching power imbalances? I'll start with you, Ramatu. Hi, thank you for having me um, here. I'm just really excited for this conversation and to get to engage with each of you. Um, I think what I've been seeing in the children and youth rights funding ecosystem is a very splintered system. I think, um, where I found is that the donors oftentimes are not talking to each other and not connected to each other. And so what happens is, is we get a field that is very sparsely funded, that is inconsistently funded, and that 
oftentimes isn't grounded in a constituency of children and youth that can inform the strategies that allow for that work to happen. Um, and that in and of itself, without a lot of the, the without the colonial patriarchal and racist frameworks that um, are embedded in the work would be problematic. And then with the layering of colonial and patriarchal and racist framings, where I think where we see that manifest in particular is the way that young people are seen, particularly young people from the global South, young people coming from racialized identities, where we see them as almost um, as powder kegs. And we're, we assume them to be um, inherently disruptive, inherently violent, inherently um, non-cooperative. And so the way that we even talk about them in these frameworks, in these global frameworks, is that they are um, in some way, it's a warning that if we don't, you know, make sure that they're kind of tucked away in the right places, in the right jobs, in the right communities, in the right sectors, if their um, needs are not met, then what will likely happen is that they will create harm, chaos, harm and chaos, those are inherently racialized um, frameworks. And it kind of harkens to a time when we think about young um, children carrying weapons and guns and that the, the chaos and the, um, that that can create. Uh, and so the challenge in that is that it means that we end up in a sector that funds young people in moments where we're fearful of their power rather than investing in their power. Um, that we don't recognize their inherent role in movements. We don't see that the movements that we lift up in as um, admirable and lift up as virtuous are often led by young people and that the tactics that are deployed in those are often led by young people. And we don't get a real full sense of the breadth of tactics that young people engage in when they're engaging um, in movement. Um, the last thing I'll say on that is I think the power imbalances, the, the inherent adultism in the work creates challenges for young people to be able to access the resources that even when they are made available to them, that they're kind of layers that they have to um, they have to um, go pass through to be able to get that those resources, and every layer takes their cut. It, the nonprofit sector is no no different than any kind of corporate. Um, I, I won't say kind of pyramid scheme, but there is some something to that. You know, the idea that every layer of uh, ecosystem gets to take a cut, and so by the time it gets to young people, that those resources are minimal, um, and they're restricted, and they're. Uh, they're not even worth it. I think as a young person myself who was doing work um, in community and organizing, it wasn't worth it. I didn't have the time, nor did I have the energy. Um, and then, you know, organizations can say, well, we don't fund youth because we're not sure if they're actually using it or if they need it. I've sat in our, uh, meetings where folks are saying, well, do young people really need resources to organize? Which is such an, I think, uh, insulting question. And I think if folks can sit with that a little bit, I don't need to tell you why that's insulting if you sit with it a little bit. Um, but I think we just have a skewed moral compass in the youth in youth funding and children's rights sector um, that isn't that doesn't get rooted in democratic values where in any other space we hold up democratic values of representation and um, of constituency as a value. And for some reason in this space, we feel like we don't need to. And I think it's a moral failing on our part. No, I mean, that's... I mean, so true. I mean, the layered and just how the children are not centered at all. Um, I'll pass it on to Saji because I know this is something you've been looking at quite a bit, particularly when it comes to young people. Thank you, Kassala. I mean, it's always an honor to be with a group like this and Robert, you really framed the conversation nicely. And one of the words, a couple of verses that stuck out was the fear for people who are fearful of youth power. I think that is really at the heart of this too. Uh, and, and when you think about these structures, so to say this, one is the inflexibility of the existing systems and the funding mechanism. And the other is the, the layers and layers of technical requirements that come with it. And this is based on a lack of understanding of who young people are and also a lack of trust in young people itself. Uh, and there are roots in colonial racist histories as we have, as, as Ramatu had really eloquently talked about. So I just want to kind of put this into an additional dimension. 
we, we understand how young people operate are horizontal in nature. They op operate horizontally and in informally, often we are forcing them now into the institutionalizing of their work. This is why Ramatu was saying, people are not interested in institutionalizing things. I don't want to be institutionalized. I want to have a freedom to do what matters because I deeply care about this. And when you institutionalize it, it takes the energy out of it. And then also we realize the systems are broken because from a conflict prevention, peace building side of things, conflicts don't care about national boundaries, but our responses are based on national boundaries. And therein lies a fallacy of how we can prevent conflict in itself. And here, of course, money goes to adults, the people who are who know. And when in the sub-Saharan African continent, the median age is 19 and they don't have any agency because they're not seen as people with power, therein lies a problem of not engaging them as the key partners in this itself. So when it comes to requirements, also they're not fit for purpose. Um, I think many applications and you know, grant applications are out there, applications are disqualified youth by applying because their age and now small organizing, their organizations are small, smaller in size. And this also disproportionately affects young women too, who are organizing, but are oftentimes discriminated against against adult women groups and also other youth groups as well. Um, I would say then also the, the money that sometimes youth-led youth -led groups get often are connected to patronage networks, so and exclusionary political networks too. So the money are, money is concentrated in the hands of a few elites who are politically connected. So while we talk about colonialism as something external coming in, there's also deep roots within the system as well that is also very patriarchal, very male oriented and very exclusionary within the context also. So this is not just something we see outside the country or the continent, but it is something we see within the countries as well, which is layered on ethnic and other forms of disc discrimination. Uh, also, I think but one, one, something we've noticed is when young people are working for peace, whether they are doing humanitarian work, human rights work, development work, or peace and conflict resolution work, they see them all as inter-integrated itself. So their work is multi-sectoral in a way, but our funding is siloed. And they're also, that it comes back to the lack of trust, lack of understanding and the lack of flexibility mechanisms have in actually supporting it. I think another thing uh, that stood out for me when Ramatu spoke was also this idea of ageism, which is very, very right. Wait your turn, you know, wait till you, you know, Till you actually grow up a little before you receive money and this kind of talk i've heard myself in a lot of contexts and what happens with this is we have the bad decisions we make because of our false stereotypes kicks the can down the road and what happens is we are putting good greater and greater burdens on the hands and shoulders and laps of young people who have to then fix the pick up the pieces that we've left of you broken and asking them to, you know, fix or put back together, which is really, really disrespectful and, and also in, in many, many ways. So if you're really talking about a do no harm approach, every donor, every implementer has a do no harm approach. And yet we don't actually, we actually doing more harm because we are kicking the can down the road and letting young people fix our, our mistake we have. So I think this is a starting point to think of how do we actually have become more responsible and accountable to the people who we serve. That's people we are serving at the community level, not donors who are rich and uh, dictating what matters. So I think this is where we need to start thinking about uh, how we, you know, so how we measure success and all that. So I'll, I'll stop there, but I think those are a couple of things I just want to share in this context. Thank you for the invitation, Gaza. I want to share my experience regarding the challenge of current grant making. One of the huge challenges is a patriarchy and power imbalance in grant making, in grant planning. Usually most of the NGOs and local organizations are not involved in this process. So it is important that we really take those things into consideration because unless we involve them in the processes, it only means 
they are grantees or recipients of funds. They are not going to be partners. The second one is that donor provide grants in isolation. There is a huge problem of silos approach, and it's, this creates competition among many local NGOs working in the communities. They fight for the funding. So it's important that we really think of considering, you know, a coordinated approach, how we're going to fund and where and how we're going to fund is very critical and important. And the third one, which is major a challenge that many research have shown on promoting children's and youth rights, is that the isolation of approach. Because we usually approach children in separate girls, schools, club or community clubs without the involvement or understanding the realities of their families, communities. So this kind of isolated approach or a separate approach without involving the families and the communities have created a major challenge between children and families. In fact, some children have been targeted for violence because they demand their rights in the difficult environment situation. So this is some of the challenge I see, critical challenge that I see in the current funding process. Thank you. And Ramatu, I know you, you wanted to add a comment regarding children. Yes, because I think this is the, I think the foil that often youth organizing encounters is that the foil is the protectionism of children, which I think is embedded in a lot, in a system of patriarchy and colonialism that sees, oftentimes sees the families of communities um, that these programs are kind of set up in oftentimes on the, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia, um, in um, the Middle East and North Africa, we see oftentimes communities as not safe places for children. That thinks a lot of the frameworks are that communities and parents and are harmful to children. We have a lot of discourses that kind of frame them that way, which then adds a need and an additional layer for these international mechanisms, these multilaterals and bilaterals and for government to, to step into that role. And it, it what it does is it further infantilizes children in some ways because their their agency is kind of layered under their parents. And if the parents is, are not seen as credible, then the children are even more, are, are seen as less powerful and that they need to be protected. And so those conversations about protectionism, I think are embedded in colonial frameworks. And that protectionism often is what is a barrier for many funders to figure out, to do the work of figuring out how to resource the work that children and young people are doing. Children are organizing. And I think that is a question, it phrases a question in way too many places. Children are organizing, children are, um, engaged in community, they are engaged in in doing much of the work in communities, particularly girls are doing much of the work in communities. And that the systems that are in place, whether they're the systems that are remnants from colonial structures or the existing funding structures, are do everything in their power to, to invisibilize that work. And then, and thus kind of, I think, leave them out of the, the community of folks that have a stake in a decision or a stake in the way that the community moves. Um, and so I, I wanted to just name children because I think it's it's a sticking point. It's a it's a huge foil for the space because folks just start to think about we can't fund children. Of course, we their children should what should children be doing rather than what are they doing? What are they engaged in? Should children be organizing? Should children be working rather than they actually all already are? And because they already are, it's vitally important that they have a stake and a say in the direction of their communities. Um, and that I think that I want to just just to point to that because it's in spaces where people are very uncomfortable with what should be going on with children. But oftentimes that question of what should be going on as children is with children is embedded in very racist, very patriarchal, very imperial um, notions of what the family should look like, of what the role of children should be and what resources that sh children have access to. Uh, and so just wanted to name that as a challenge in the funding space. I fully agree with Ramatu. I think this is so critical. The other side of this, this idea that young people are troublemakers and, and they are, cannot be trusted and therefore they are a burden. And if you think about who are these troublemakers, they happen to be black and brown skin people. We don't equate troublemakers to, you know, Anglo-Saxon white people who are protesting or anything like that. 
And what happens is it builds a stereotype. These, these, these young people who are black and brown need to be controlled and managed. And therein lies a lot of our racist roots coming in to thinking our young people are troublemakers that need to be controlled. So that, you know, and within the youth space, especially, this has become very prominent. There are a small minority group of young people who may cause trouble, have been stereotyped as everyone, all young people are bad. But research is showing that even the small group of people who might cause trouble or who are causing trouble have roots within adults who are pushing them and motivating them too. So this idea that young people who are black and brown cannot be trusted, they are violent, is really, you know, it's also rooted in this. The Youth Peace and Security Agenda forced ourselves to ask a new question. And that was about why are most young people peaceful? It wasn't about going down this rabbit hole asking why are most young people joining armed groups and gangs and cults and violent groups? What are the push and pull factors? I think we've spent billions and billions of dollars trying to unpack that and we still can't get answers because we're asking the wrong questions. It is, and that, those questions are based on the roots of racism and ignorance and stereotypes. If you want to understand why are most young people peaceful, similar to Ramatou's question about children, I think we are going to discover much more wealth of knowledge and wisdom that often gets neglected or ignored because of these issues. And I would just add there that I, I think there's a there's this notion of innocence. And I think that's what I was trying to get at a little bit earlier that I was it was embedded in what I was saying earlier. There's a notion of innocence and that, as Asaji said, that that children are black and brown young people are troublemakers. And so it's best that we invest, we put most of our resources in early childhood because maybe we can catch them before they're kind of become more barbarian, um, before they become more radicalized. It is the challenge of doing political work with young people and really funding work that is political with young people because the fear is then what will happen, they'll get older and become savages. And no one will of course say anything to that effect and you know, but I think it's embedded, the assumption is embedded in the work that we do, that if we if we can teach them early, we might be able to civilize them, which is embedded in the civilizing project of development that has been part of the, from, from its inception, is that we can civilize the, the these societies by civilizing children, which is why we see so much in the way of resources around um, younger children and the fear around older children you know, there's still an innocence that can be found in the younger children and that we tie ch innocence to childhood. Um, and if innocence is lost, then the child is somehow lost. And I think we definitely see that in work with girls around um, pregnancy, around sexual violence with girls, is that, you know, we, we, as much as we would argue against that, oftentimes adultify girls once they've been assaulted, once they've been married, once they become mothers, and that adultification is in part because we there's a thought that their innocence is somehow lost and that and if that innocence is lost their childhood is lost um so i think there's a lot of narrative strains of narratives that feed the ind the industries that we are engaged in and that make it really difficult um to resource this work well no i mean it's really fascinating i think you pointed to how you know particularly the donor community you know, they're not allowing children and young people or communities to tell their story. You know, they've created a narrative for them and that is, you know, perpetuated in so many different ways. You know, as we move forward and kind of look ahead, I mean, it does seem like the system really needs to be shaken up. You know, we need innovation. Why aren't we seeing innovation and what are the structural barriers to innovation and systematic change? I think going forward if we want to improve the funding situation i think in my opinion there are some issues that we have to take into consideration one is understanding the realities of the children's situation understanding in any geographic situation in any country there are many actors local actors international actors regional actors who are working with children and youth right we have to understand that ecosystem before starting the grant making who is doing what in which areas so it is important understanding the realities understanding who's doing what 
and trying to um, to create our own spaces in collaboration with other actors. How do we contribute to that kind of environment rather than coming with funds and disrupting sometimes some of the existing good examples? So it is important understanding the environment where we are operating. The second one is that it's very important is listening. We need to give donors and funders need to give space and time and tools as well to listen to children, to listen to young people or young youth, to listen to adolescents, to listen to families, communities, so that we have a holistic understanding of before we start the grant making. This is important and very critical. In our organization, for example, what we do is that we have a four to six months planning and learning grant, which we give to partners. We organize partners in clusters model, cluster partnership, encourage three to five, two to five organizations to work together in one geographic area, and we give them a planning and learning grant to listen to children, families, communities, but also to share their experiences, organizational knowledge before developing a proposal, long-term proposal for us. So this kind of giving time and space and tools will help donors to understand the realities of where they are operating and understanding the situation. The third one is that you know, keep learning. This is very important. Learning is critical and important for donors as well as for the implementing partners because we can learn a lot from our, from our involvement. So projects from the start to the end should be a learning process. We need to learn, we need to share the learning, we need to document the learning and share it among the partners with donors as well. So there is a lot of learning, there is a lot of challenge that we can learn from. So it is important learning has to be critical part of the child rights and youth rights program work. I think one of the challenges is that the innovation exists. Uh, there's amazing work happening. Um, and I guess the simplest answer to that question is that they're not being resourced. So the work is, ha people are doing, and I and I, I actually sit with, I, I, I run a children's rights innovation fund. So I'm, but I often sit a little bit uncomfortable with the term innovation and I understand it relative to something. It is not innovation for the sake thereof. It is relative to what we're exist doing currently. There's a part of me that resists it a bit because I think we, one of the things that I feel like I've learned in my philanthropic career is we've got to stop saying we don't know what we already know. We know that we need to get resources in the hands of the folks that are trying to create change. We need to get resources in the hands and the majority of the resources in the hands that are pe with people who are doing the work that we think we, we say we think is important. And yet we find every way not to put that money in their hands or to create barriers for the use of that money. So it's not as if we do not know. We know, but we have to do a report and a study every time to tell us exactly what we already know. We have to do a strategic plan and a strategic framework to tell us what we already know, which is get the hands and the money of the people who are doing this work. And many of those people are young people. Many of those people are children. And so we don't see innovation because we keep looking for innovation, I think, in lots of ways, rather than doing what we know. The innovation is not going to come from philanthropy. It's going to come from the folks that are actually doing the work. I think some of us are kind of frustrated program managers who, you know, feel like we, we actually know if we just tweaked it this way, we, you know, then the program would work. And so we try to do all the tweaking embedded in our kind of grant making design. And then there's not a lot of room for the folks that are doing the work to do the tweaking. So I think one of the structural barriers is this constant seeking. I don't know if it's affirmation or it's, I don't, I, it's, a, it's a building out of portfolios in such a way that it does not allow for the freedom of expression that would come from folks just having the having a money in front of them and saying what what can we do with this money to make change what can we do with this money to advance our work and that is it's it's extremely simple and then we layer on the layer of consult it's an industry so we layer on the consultants and we layer on the program design and the strategic frameworks and the strategic planning and then the boards all of those are layers of power that like I said, they, they pull resources. Every single layer of that chain has resources that pull from it. And ultimately we end up with the same 
conclusions that we already know. There is not a magic, a magic, you know, plan that's going, we're not going to find the, you know, the, the, the letter, the map in the bottle, um, coming off, you know, coming onto shore on the beach where that's going to give us the answers. We know who we need to resource. We don't want to resource them because we don't trust them. Um, and then we just build structures around that distrust. And so I think that's where we're finding the, the greatest barriers. If I can build on uh, one or two excellent points, uh, I think, you know, when you asked about barriers, then structural barriers specifically, structural barriers are increase, you know, recognize, they don't recognize that people are behind these structures. But when you understand who, that people are behind this, people who are very, very privileged and they are placed, they, they, they don't really oftentimes even see there's a need to change. What's the incentive for them to change when things are working for them and their benefit? So they tell their boards, everything is fine. We have raised this much, we have this much money. So it's about the amount of money that they have. And oftentimes a little bit of money from case studies and stories of impact, often based on the idea that this is, we are helping young people look at improving their lives and they happen to be black and brown and all that. And there's an emotive feeling of feeling good. So that is enough. But so we are, we, are, we are not uncomfortable. So we are in a comfort zone. And so the structure, big, bigger structure barriers are we the people itself who are part of some of these with the funding instruments who are not comfortable to, to change itself. So, and we have asked, why is it that we are so stubborn and are not willing to change if we already have all the answers that Ramadu already said? So what does it say about us as humans and individuals who are part of these privileged structures who can who are being roadblocks or door openers? I think that's a question we need to ask ourselves in this in this process as well. No, I mean it's so true. And I think, you know, Ramatu, you, you noted that it's we're an industry and that's come up in a all the conversations. And I think the fact that we're naming it as an industry with layers of power, I think that's really important. One of the feedback that we've gotten as we were planning the Institute is that, can you talk about solutions, like a way forward? You know, yes, we need to talk about the problems, but how do we look ahead? Um, and I, you know, as someone who's, who used to work kind of in the foundation world, I often do see that funding mechanisms could be a way, it could be one avenue for solutions. Um, so, you know, in your view, you know, what are the solutions and new framings to these structural power inequities and these, you know, power imbalances that you've been discussing so far? There are a lot of part, you know, active collaborators in the communities. There are private sector, there are youth movement, there are a lot of activities. So we need not only to work NGOs and local organizations, but also the private sectors. We also want to work with community organizations that are operating in the community. So we have to be involved others as well, even though they are not part of our, you know, grant making. But we need to involve them, you know, to in different ways, so to understand and to look at, explore how they can contribute to children's and youth right work and promotion. So this is very critical to involve the unlikely partners in the community involved in this kind of initiative. Crowd makers also have to be seriously to consider, you know, the unexpected. We have to be flexible. We have to give space and time for our partners to make mistakes, to dare and sometimes to, you know, look at some new ideas. So this way we can make learning more open, more flexible, so that people can have Usually at this time, most of the donors are really don't give that kind of opportunities for the partners to learn and to dare and to expect the unexpected and to make mistakes. So it is very important that we give that kind of opportunities for our partners. The other critical initiative is that most of the donors are not working with community organizations and local news because they think they don't have they have limited capacities. But these institutions, community institutions, are critical and important because proximity-wise, they are close to the children, close to the young people, close to the families. Even though they have limited capacity, we need to support the capacity development work of this organization and involve them in the community work. This most of these organizations are born in that community. They are there 
and the founders and most of the workers are in that community. So it's important to think long term if we're thinking of movement building, these are the nucleus for movement building to promote children's and youth rights and protection as well as safeguarding. So this is important to think of a long term process, even though it's cost wise it's high, but you know we if we build these initiatives, this organization initiative, it makes a difference in the project development. I came into philanthropy, I think, um, relatively green and, and not really understanding, I think, what it was. Um, but I think what it what that offered me was a very, I think there's a cynical eye that I bring to this where I, I think the whole thing is a mess. And so my particular role in this mess is to be disruptive in the way, in, in, the, in the best way that I can and be clear about my imperative, which is to move money to my people. Um, and I'm, and when I say my people, I mean, those of us that are fighting for liberation, those of us are seeking a better world forward. And I've been fortunate enough to be given a privileged role in this space. And for every moment that I'm in it, it is incumbent upon me to get money to my folks and to enlist as, a, as many people as possible in that same, in that same kind of project. And so um, in, as I've had the opportunity to build out the Children's Rights Innovation Fund, one of the things that's been really important to me is to build community around the work. And so the first thing that we do with CRIF is we think about how do we, how do we spark innovation that moves the philanthropic sector towards addressing the root causes of children's rights violations and understanding children and young people as our primary constituency, not our only constituency, but our primary constituency in this work. And then how do we take on the questions that move that conversation and not just the conversation, because we have lots of conversations, but that we are we are bringing to bear enough people who are also committed to moving resources to people, to our people, which are these young people that are committed to that, that we're all trying to disrupt the systems in our own respective ways. I think that is important to me. So we're building community around this work. Our first innovation in air quotes that we're taking on is around racism and decolonization and colonialism. So racism and colonialism as a root cause of children's rights violations. And how do we resource the young people and children who are actively working to dismantle those forces? and get the resources as close to them as possible in ways that create minimal barriers. And what that means, one, is that we bear the brunt of those barriers. So we know that the systems have not changed yet. We have not completely disrupted philanthropy in such a way that what it takes to get money to anyone is a several hoops. You know, you gotta have a bank account, you gotta have an ID, you gotta have an organization, you have to have a role in an organization, you have to have the resources to be able to report back on that. Um, and so if we can, absorb as an institution as much of that as possible to free up the space and the energy and the innovation of those young people, then we're doing our job. And if we can get that money to them with as few strings attached, with the ethic of trust and the and the and the um opportunity to say that like I trust your vision and we're gonna go with this on you. We're gonna go with you on this. If we can do that, then we're doing at least our part and doing right by the movements that we're engaging in. So I think that for me is one solution is I think folks that are in, in these roles, these our program officers, our program managers, our directors, gotta get very cynical about this system. I think sometimes I'm in meetings and folks are so earnest about their strategies. And I'm like, you know, your strategies are not getting us free. Your strategies are your way to extract those resources from the wealth this global wealth so that those resources can be redistributed to our people. And if that's not your commitment, then you can't disrupt anything. I think that that's what I fundamentally see as my role, whether it's through CRIF, whether it's through my next role, my commitment is to get money to my people and to get money to these movements that are trying to disrupt and dismantle these systems of oppression. And I'm clear on that commitment and we'll do that in whatever capacities. Sometimes I, the joke is that I say, you know, you make the mistake of bringing me on, that's what we're trying to do. And if that's not what you're trying to do, then you probably made a mistake in bringing me on. But in the meantime, while I'm there, my commitment is moving this money. That is my role in philanthropy. I'm no longer in the streets in the way that I used to be. I'm no longer running programs on the ground. 
but I'm moving, I'm tr- my, my role in this movement right now to dismantle these structures is to move money to my people. And I think if we can get more cynical about the systems we're embedded in and no, not so earnest about our strategic plans and so beholden to them that we can't see the f- um, forest for the trees, then we can begin to disrupt these systems that are harmful. Not just that they're not working, they're profoundly and deeply harmful. Um, and to, I think the, the, to the extent that we can get clear about that is the extent that we begin to move and develop new new systems of hopefully balance, not so much power, but systems of balance and structures of equity. No, I mean, on that note, Saji, I'm gonna pass it on to you because I know you've been looking at the youth ecosystem and also are a fellow disruptor. A good troublemaker. So I've also been in this field for about 20, 25 years, going through the war in Sri Lanka and seeing how international actors have come in and made a f- industry out of it and made lots of money out of it and billions of dollars and spent and yet, you know, people's lives are still shattered. And, uh, you know, I grew up with that. I've also seen it from an academic perspective and now I'm a part of an international NGO also looking at raising money and using the money for good in continent in trying to build peace around countries where I do a uh, majority in those countries. And, uh, you know, I'm coming from this, from seeing the repercussions of this and also being deeply cynical about it and wanting to be a good troublemaker and a disruptor because this is what I see this generation of young people are actually wanting. Uh, but I wanted to take a step back and think about this a little bit because Funding I have seen is transactional in nature, but but at the heart of what we are talking about is a relational issue and trust issue. And and young people see themselves simply as beneficiaries and not partners in these funding ecosystems. So the the youth fund that we've recently set up comes from years of talking with lots of other funders and lots of other partners and young people about what, what the world kind of needs when it comes to supporting this. And we have to start, you know, as Ramadan said, we have to be radical about this. Radical primarily for me because young people today are demanding transparency. They are demanding horizontal leadership and wanting to be part of solutions and to be engaged as partners at the same time. And they wanting to feel like they are part of something greater than themselves. So if you take those ingredients, it's important to recognize that the relationship between a donor and a recipient it's not a subservient relationship between people, but a partnership relationship. I think that's really important to understand, uh, especially with the generation that is connected globally, but acting locally, and they have this translocal nature to the world. We need to start seeing them as a partner. So with that, there are like four different components that we have looked at of how to shift and shape a new ecosystem when it comes to resourcing youth leadership. One is this idea of making people feel like they're part of something bigger, a community. So fund is not just about coming to get money, which is a transactional and moving to a relation. And it's about a community where young people have access to mentorship and coaching and training, networking, but more importantly, that wanting to feel like they're part of something greater. I think that is fundamentally missing from these spaces. So, this, you know, we are looking at ways to create that. The second is around the financing of youth leadership, which is where these grants mechanisms exist. And I think here, the principles of collaborative action for collective impact is at the heart of the the youth peace and security fund itself and collaborative decision-making and financing. Again, moving from transactional where you apply for a grant and one organization gets it and they compete for it. We need to move beyond that. where young people are doing joint conflict analysis, joint problem solving and receiving the funding as individuals and groups and organizations, registered and unregistered, to actually address the collective problems that they find, identify and financing that collectively. So we have to shift our mindset from how do we make sure, as Ram said, get money to the hands of the people. How do we make sure more people benefit than a few people benefiting? Because then it gets to the patronage system we want to avoid. So this is where everyday people feel like they're part of the solution and part of something bigger. And this is really the part of it. Because I, I, you know, this is old adage of it takes a village. And the truth is it's not, you can't, it doesn't take a big international NGO or big national organization to address this. It takes people. The biggest changes in the world have come from we the people, not we the organizations. 
So how do we finance that we the people in a way that really is encompassing this? The third innovation, I think the piece around this is looking at young people as investors and partners. Here, how do we think of this as them not being just beneficiaries, but having them being investors? Often again, rooted in this colonialist mindset, we think you young people who are poor or brown or black are poor and they don't have anything, so we need to help them. If you go beyond that and see them with the agency that they are, see them with as investors, we're able to create a fund that actually is not just funded by rich people, but also funded and supported by we the people also from within these communities. So the YPS fund we are setting up is actually incentivizing people to donate small contributions from one or two dollars all the way up to two thousand to five thousand to ten thousand and more. And we were already started to get receiving money without doing much to market this out. The part of this is about also making sure that young people are not just giving money, but also are in the decision-making role in these processes. So when, when you see this, how can they become decision-making from point? Like how can they be in the governance boards that are, the governance boards are not in DC and in New York, but governance boards that are close to the issues. And 50% or so of decision-making authority lies in the hands of, of young people also. So you see young people at a, as a partner, even at the decision-making level is important to really break down our stereotypes of who young people are and see them with power uh, is critical here. And I think that the fourth piece around this is the operating operational model. It's more decentralized using, you need to, you need to think of using technology and embracing that technology to connect people, processes and decisions that really find new ways to get money into those hands of people. There are lots of different ways to do that, that are, that are not transactional in nature, that help reduce the overhead and do this with trust in mind. I think we can look at technological solutions that are out there that are already starting to make some headway. So there's a that's another key piece of an operational model to think of. So we have talked about operational model, decision models, and a people model of who they are in this in this processes is critical. Great. I mean, I think oftentimes you people say, and you noted this moment too, that, oh, it's not possible to get money to the ground. Like, it's just, no, that that's not how it works. You can, and you will get money to those who need it. And I think it's just, you know, to be a bit more disruptive and also looking at what's actually available. I would those say that it is impossible to get money to the ground as the struct in the structures that we have? Not to, not to minimize that, that there are the barriers to resourcing young people still are, are, are formidable. Um, and even as we try to work around those and to mitigate the, the harm that that creates, um, I think just it cannot be overstated that those barriers are significant. And they, and I, and I'm, I've seen enough examples of getting the resources to the ground that they're not necessary. So just for those that are kind of, we have a lot of assumptions about what's required legally that is not required, that is actually not required. It is custom. There are lots of customs in philanthropy and in the INGO sector that we take as law that are not law. And so I think there it has to be a reckoning and a questioning of all of these rules that and laws and policies that we put in place and understand them to be custom in many places, not ne- and not necessarily law. That's a really important point. And when I um, was working at Elevate Children, one of the things that really struck me as someone who's always on the other side of the table, working for an organization as a recipient of funds, I always assumed that this was law, this was like black and white, this is what it is. And then the more and more I was in the space, I realized, as you said, it's assumptions, it's assumed that you need certain things. And I think that, you know, we really do need to break that facade around that these are required, because that is what, on the other side, that's what the perception is. And it's embedded in, in the idea that we don't trust the people that are getting the resources. So many of those customs are colonial, and racist because it is the assumption that certain people, black and brown people are not to be trusted with money. And so we have to create rules and barriers. When we know in history, actually, the folks that are least trustful with money are often the wealthy, Um, but we have these rules in place to keep resources away from black and brown folks 
And so a lot of the vast majority of the rules and policies and the, that we assume are law are oftentimes customs that we've put in place because of distrust. Oh, that's a really critical point. Saje, do you want to make a comment? I just, I was, it's really inspiring listening to Ramatu always and just building off of that. Ultimately, it comes down to people, not structures. These are people who are making decisions based on their worldview. And that comes down to us, what type of a world do you want to leave behind and what kind of world do you want to be part of over the next five to 10 years? Not looking at the world of today, because again, you're basing our customs based on today as well. But let's think about how the next five to 10 years and see how we can be a little uncomfortable and get out of our comfort zone to really think of what solutions can exist over the next five years and be part of those. Because that's what you're going to be remembered for, not for holding things down and controlling things today. Because that's that's what everyone is doing. I think if you're looking for being a hero or a hero, this is a good place to start. Then. No, thank you. I mean, as we wrap up the conversations, um, I mean, as part of the, these conversations we've been having within the institute. Um, you know, there is this renewed, we're trying to facilitate renewed discussions regarding the future of humanitarian and development aid and within that international children's rights. You know, as we are reframing, whose vision and framings are we privileging in that reimagination? And, you know, when, what, what role do you see, you know, these funding mechanisms playing in this reimagining and reprivileging? There's a... Um... A, a been a bit of work being done about how communities do philanthropy in ways that are more embedded in community. So um, I'll offer my my own community as an example. I grew up in a community of Sierra Leonean immigrants in the Washington DC area. And many of, at the time of my growing up, most folks were undocumented. So could not access systems of like, um, of welfare, of support, you know, of protection. And so folks relied on what they knew about how community functions and provided for each other. So there was never a shortage of resources for a naming ceremony, a wedding to care for a child. I think I bring that experience into my understanding of what it means to be humanitarian. And I think we need to really think through, um, we, we think of philanthropy as high net worth, you know, tr transfer of resources. But the reality is, I think Saji's work makes really clear, is that yet pe folks have been taking care of themselves in lots of ways for a long time. And that if we're thinking about one of the ways we might reimagine and who else we might privilege is to understand those systems of embedded community philanthropy and understand how folks resource their movements without us. It's not as if, you know, we notice that change is happening even when philanthropy is always five to 10 steps behind and trying to play catch up. Change would happen better if the folks had resources, but the reality is, is that folks aren't waiting for philanthropy. So I think one is decentering ourselves, decentering philanthropy, decentering humanitarian and development aid as to, to the conversation. That work is happening if you if you are truly in in this for the hum, for humanity or in this for philanthropy. You got to get right and centered with those movements. Then work is happening. And that I do believe we have to get clear in the sector in that reframing of how change happens. Is There is some change that happens incrementally by meeting the needs of folks that are in a place. And I will never, ever discount the importance of meeting the needs of folks that are not having their needs met. But the way that systemic and societal change happens is in movement. It's when people are collectivized, they're politicized, and they see a change that they want to create, and they understand how they can do that together. And so the reframing of all of the work that we do has to be rooted in that idea that we are reimagining a world where people are engaged and able to have some self-determination around the, the communities that they get to live in, and that they're able to be to collectivize and there are ways that they, they they see avenues for collectivization that young people can can have a plethora of groups and organizations that they can join that are making change and that if there isn't an organization they can join that they feel powerful enough to get with other young people or other folks and work towards that change so i think 
there's a movement orientation that needs to be embedded in, even in the most humanitarian of aid, where we're meeting basic needs, there's an understanding that collective power is vital and critical. It is not to be feared in the way that we fear it. And that this idea of this individualized notion of how change happens is, is not only dangerous to all of us, it's dangerous to that person that we lift up and put on a pedestal. We don't, if we notice those folks don't often survive. And so it's important that we hold the importance of collective models of change. Of what, and to me, that's what movement is, is when people can see each other and be in relation to one another and think about and dream about the world that they want to live in and then feel the power to be able to move in that direction. Um, and that's not a utopian view, but it's an essential view. It's what is the basis of any kind of beloved society. And so I think as a big picture, um, that's a good way to start and how we reframe and reimagine. Um, I'll pass it along to Saji because I know Saji will get us more concrete than what I'm offering, but I, that's the where I would start. Well, no, Ramatu, you it was very beautifully framed. Uh, and, and very much this movement mindset is at the heart of what I would also say is needed. I think uh, people people's roles in decision making is so critical as investors and co-actors and implementers. But funding is really important to shift more beyond from funding projects. We need to look at how do we resource and fund people's leadership and networks. Because at the end of the day, this is a the movement mindset is at the heart of that. The second I would say is this collective power Ramatu we really talked about, this convening power of donors to come together and co-invest on the long run. Instead of the short term, this project mentality, we can we have to really break out. And you know, with all the ugliness that this pandemic has happened, has shown us, what it has also shown us is the naked truth that how interdependent we are and how much we need to really break out of the systems that we are and to actually really imagine what we can create together. So this idea of collect co-convening and investing on the long run is so critical than the short-term one month or one year short-term projects. We need to think differently about this. Uh, third, I think is really important to think of to measure what truly matters to communities and indicators and processes that matter to communities, not just to the donors that we think is important because there's a big discrepancy in there. And here, again, looking at communities for collective level impact, I think there is this model of collective impact model that FSI and other organizations have promoted. And there's a lot of wisdom in that that could be applied also in uh, developing countries really embed something that is endogenous to a lot of our countries where we work collectively just like it takes a village it takes all of us so this idea of collective is so embedded in that so how do we think of measuring the collective there are a lot of examples that are really promising coming from around the world as well another thing i think is uh, you know we thought ramadu mentioned about safeguarding and protection of children and youth for example and seeing the innocence and moving beyond. Uh, but the reality is we are working, we are living in a world that is getting uglier and uglier. States and government agencies are beginning, are increasingly being fearful of this growing power that young people have. And oftentimes, instead of seeing them as seeing it as a blessing and embracing it and partnering, they're actually spending more money and effort to, to squelch it in around the world. So what is the donor's responsibility in this space is very critical. Again, here, we shouldn't go back to these patriarchal ways of thinking of protection and self-guarding, right? And how, in, in, uh, from a financing perspective, how do you finance safeguarding and protection as part and parcel of a broader uh, framework for implementation is something to think of. An example here is we have gender analysis. We need to also do good risk, and, uh, risk analysis and conflict analysis but really make sure we are financing those things. So there's in case something happens, there's money to actually make sure that the young people are protected, safeguarded, and have meaningful access from legal to other for if they come under threat from the state, you know, people that are supposed to be protecting them. These are the state institutions like police and military and others. So this is a reality. It's only going to increase over the next coming years because of climate change and others. And this is something that if donors don't get right now, we're going to face 
humongous consequences because of our inaction itself. The other reality we are facing is that there's a huge focus on local. And I think there's a, there's a lot of power in that because it is the wisdom exists locally. So we need to resource these things locally. At the same time, we realize that conflicts are all, even though they are local, there is a cross-border dimension to it, transnational boundaries to, uh, dimensions to it. So how do we think about, in a, in a conflict setting, if you're trying to prevent and transform conflict, what do we think, you know, how we need to embrace more of a, conf, a geography or conflict approach to think of prevention. So how do donors come together and think of mitigation and prevention in those frameworks is critical. So local actors matter and can make a tremendous impact locally, but the power that they have is limited because of outside forces coming in. This is where the international community needs to play a much more prominent role. It, this, I'm not saying that they are, they are defunct in this new system. They actually have a role to play if their courage is enough to step in and play that role. The systems need to be brought, you know, upgraded a little to do that. So I would say those are some of the ways to think of over the next generation, how do we reframe financing? Those are a couple of thoughts in this. I think the most important thing for me is that understanding the realities of where we are operating, as I said, but there are institutions in the community, community institutions that are not formally registered, but you know, there are a burial association, there are credit associations, saving and credit associations, there are you know, a lot of institutions where mothers, young people come together and share their experience. We need to consider this institution as part of the movement building. These are the critical institutions that are supported and respected by community actors. We need to encourage them to be part of the, our work our grant making. We may not give them grants, but they, know they have to be part of that initiative. We have to explore ways how they can be engaged and to be part of our initiative, our grant making work. So this is very critical and important. The clusters are the long term strategies of building community, movement building in the community. Our thinking is that our local partners, local NGOs and community organizations and other informal actors in the community have to come together to build that initiative. We're thinking of to select key leaders in the community from this community organization, local NGOs and the informal community organizations and train them on community movement so that there is a kind of a broader community movement initiated to promote children's and youth rights. So this is critical and important. If our goal is communicating movement, movement building can start from this kind of leaders, community leaders, because those who are working in the community should be part of this initiative. So for us, for donors, this is critical and important that community organizations are co the core issue of our work. To engage unlikely actors like the private sectors in the community, shop owners, small scale cottage industry owners so that they can be part of our work in the in the child rights and youth movement. Because these are the critical actors that provide internship, they could be provide finance, they could also be involved in supporting young people with skills, skills transfer. So the idea of working with community organizations is critical and important and this is how we develop effective and initiative at the community level. If donors are interested, this is the way to go about it. As well, you know, it is important also to link with other actors, you know, what we learn at the community level, be shared at national level, globally even. So it is important that there is a link between global initiative and local initiative. So there is that strategic link between what is going on in child rights and use of rights movement. Well, thank you. I think we could have the conversation for hours. Um, I mean, all the insights have just been so powerful. I mean, during the first conversation, the speakers, you know, really called for us to sit with our discomfort and, you know, ex expand our political imagination and cultivate rebellion. I mean, those were the kind of the call to action. And I think this conversation, in many ways, you provided concrete ways of us doing that, particularly when it comes to funding and really, you know, 
trusting the people. I think that's what we need to do as we move forward. But thank you again to Ramatu, Saji, and Fasil. We greatly appreciate all your feedback, um, and thank you. Thank you.